Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Comics Rot Your Brain, the show where screenwriters talk about the comic books that we love, mostly from the 1980s. And I'm one of your hosts, I'm Stephen Bagatorian, and normally this is where my phenomenal co-host Chris Derrick chimes in, but we're doing something a little bit different this week, because Chris is away on assignment creating uh, extraordinary television for you folks out there, and we wanted to make sure that we still got you an episode right now, so we're doing a little solo episode deal and i'm gonna try to take a relatively brief look haha famous last words at uh one of my favorite pieces of uh mainstream comic book art from the 1980s which is uh two issues of world's finest comics drawn by the extraordinary Trevor Von Eden. As longtime listeners of CRYB are well aware, Trevor Von Eden is perhaps my favorite comic book artist of modern times. Actually, you know what? I'll take away the perhaps. I will say, yes, Trevor Von Eden is my favorite comic book artist of modern times. And in particular, I am just in love with the work that he did in the 80s that we've been covering on this show. Please check out our previous uh, our previous four-hour deep dive into Thriller with uh, uh, Robert Lauren Fleming and Trevor Von Eden putting together uh, some part of a masterpiece there. And we had quite a discussion, Chris and I, on that. But today it is World's Finest Comics and perhaps the most psychedelic Superman and Batman story ever published by DC Comics. And when I decided I wanted to look at these issues today, I initially thought it was just one issue. And uh, it was an issue that has these particularly sort of hallucinogenic looking images of Superman in these wild montage pages that I'd always seen kind of published in different spots online. Michel Fife had published them uh, back when he did an interview with Trevor Von Eden in the Comics Journal, which I think was later also published on Fife's website, uh, or perhaps that was a separate interview with Trevor. But these images of Trevor's sort of psychedelic Superman have been floating out there for a while. And I finally thought, you know what, I should really read those, uh, what I thought was just one issue where those images came from turned out to be two issues. And then it turned out that it was actually a four part storyline. And I, I ended up reading all four parts of the story so I could actually talk about it and it would make sense when I discussed it here today. But I'm going to give a relatively brief summary of the story because it's a little bit convoluted and I don't know that it's entirely worth getting into the weeds of it. But uh, it's a four part story where it's written by David Anthony Kraft and two parts of the story are actually drawn by legendary Legion of Superheroes artist Steve Lytle and... Um, inked by two separate inkers, I believe Sal Trapiani inks the first Lytle issue, and then uh, Dennis Janky inks the second one. The Janky inked issue is uh, much better looking than the Trapiani issue, but I will say that I don't think that these books are necessarily Steve Lytle's finest hour, so I'm not really going to talk about those issues too much here, because I actually love Steve Lytle as an artist. I think he's one of the most underrated cover artists in the history of comics. I think he did some just amazing work on Legion of Superheroes and some of his covers are so iconic and I'd love to talk about him further at some point in the future but we are here today to talk about Trevor Von Eden and uh, so I'm going to be discussing these two issues of World's Finest Comics that Trevor drew which were issues 305 and 307 which technically speaking are part two and part four of this four-part storyline okay so it's a little weird we're just covering parts two and four of a four part story. So um, for those that care, let me just read you a little bit about what the story is all about. And then we can get into discussing uh, Trevor's incredibly evocative and unique visual approach to the story, which you are no doubt uh, gazing in amazement at right now as it's scrolling or playing by on the video accompanying uh, what I'm saying here. And hopefully you're ooing and aahing over the incredible insanely emotional, expressionistic, impressionistic line work, and the eye-popping colors by Mr. Carl Gafford. And uh, let me just say, Carl Gafford colored these two issues that Trevor drew, and Trevor's issues were 
split, the inking duties were split rather, between Mr. Pablo Marcos on the first issue that Trevor did, which is issue 305, and Trevor himself inks his own pencils on 307. Pablo Marcos, uh, it goes without saying, is a extraordinary and extremely noteworthy comic book artist in his own right. He's a legendary figure, just an absolutely amazing artist with a long and unbelievable career of work. He's really a masterful comic artist himself. And so Pablo Mar- Marcos, uh, working with Trevor Von Eden here, it's kind of an all-star team as far as I'm concerned. And then Trevor inking himself is just wild and exquisite on the final part here. But uh, it's David Anthony Kraft, like I said before, who wrote the storyline here. He's perhaps best remembered for being the originator, the creator of the fanzine slash magazine comics interview, which was published for a long time in the 80s. It was kind of another one of the magazines that was out there at the same time as uh, Amazing Heroes, Comics Buyer's Guide, and of course, the Comics Journal in the fan press in the days before the internet. Yes, indeed, there was such a time before the internet. And David Anthony Kraft is Comics Interview Magazine. To me, it was never quite as interesting as Amazing Heroes. Didn't really cover the breadth of topics that you would get in your average issue of some other sort of fanzine slash magazines. But there were some very... uh, noteworthy and memorable interviews in comics interview. So I will, I will pick that up when I see it in dollar bin still, but anyways, he was a writer as well. And so he wrote this four part storyline, which I will now summarize briefly. Cause what I really want to do here today is talk to you about Trevor's line work, Trevor's choices and Trevor's own thoughts on his approach to drawing during this period, which is immediately post thriller after the bad experience that Trevor ultimately had on thriller, which was somewhat devastating to him and uh, actually really changed the way he was feeling about drawing comics in general. uh, Trevor did draw some fill in issues here and there for DC comics. And this two part world's finest comes post thriller when Trevor was going through a deep depression, as we'll hear him talk about in an interview with FIFA that I'm going to be quoting from. But I think it's worth noting Trevor's mind state and his general approach and his own thoughts on these pages. And this imagery, which I think is so unique and so striking, but let me just first get into the storyline such as it is. So the story involves these two supervillains named null and void who are two um, rarely used uh, supervillains as far as I know, and I think not a whole lot had happened with them, at least in the 80s and 90s at DC. Um, Perhaps they've come back since then, but they were created in a previous issue of World's Finest. And let me give you a brief history on the characters, and then it kind of bleeds into a history of this four-part story. Okay, so uh, it's about these two guys, Null and Void, all right? They're kind of quote unquote, gentlemen thieves. They're like these middle-aged dudes who become a super criminal team. Okay. Uh, It starts off with this guy, Peter McDonald. He was a young smuggler. I'm going to be quoting here from dc.fandom.com where it's a helpful summary. So I don't have to try to, uh, you know, strain my brain too much to uh, summarize this. Null and Void were enemies of Superman and Batman. Peter McDonald was a young smuggler who operated in the Caribbean Sea. He was eventually hired by the father of young Solomon Baxter to rescue Solomon from an island controlled by Nazis. Peter managed to take Solomon out of the island on his plane. Unfortunately, the plane was struck by the Nazis and it fell. It crashed onto a nearby island where Solomon, a.k.a. Saul, and Peter were captured by natives who performed some voodoo ceremonies on them. All of this is a bit problematic, I would say, by 2024 standards, probably in terms of the uh, the relative demonization of the voodoo ceremony, etc. But we'll we'll put that to the side. Uh, so some voodoo magic was performed on Saul and Peter for some reason. It's never quite entirely clear, I don't think. Uh, but after this ceremony, their hands become marked with a special tattoo. And when they join hands, Saul transforms into Null and Peter transforms into Void. And they have different powers amongst them here. And their criminal adventures started as they realized that Null has the power to take away people's senses, their seeing and their hearing and such. So he essentially nullifies people. And Void has the power to transport folks 
in his proximity into this weird psychedelic Ditko-esque Doctor Strange type of an alternate dimension and pluck people out of our reality and just plant them into this weird, um, very hallucinogenic realm. Okay, so Void can transport you to this uh, realm of weirdness and Null can nullify you. Together, they start a criminal partnership and... um, After years and years of abusing their powers for their own benefits, Saul dissolves their partnership in order to settle down and start a family. A few years later, his life starts to crumble because of financial problems with the IRS, which is kind of endearingly banal uh, in terms of a middle-aged (laughs) supervillain facing down the IRS. So he has to go back to his uh, villainous ways. So he rejoins Peter once again so they can become null and void. This time, their crime spree is halted by Superman and Batman. Uh, Peter was captured by the heroes, but they cannot prove their case against Peter in court, which is actually where this four-part World's Finest story picks up, because it was in a previous appearance in World's Finest that we saw their initial introduction, their adventures, etc. But this story starts off with Superman and Batman literally in a courtroom, unable to prove what they're trying to prove against this guy, Peter, Null. And so... Peter is released after his trial and finds out that Saul has hit rock bottom financially. So they join up again and they decide to travel to Costa Rica looking for the source of their powers. Their actions in Costa Rica cause an international conflict. Okay, and here's where we get into the kind of convoluted uh, David Anthony Kraft storyline here. Uh, Null and Void in Costa Rica looking for the source of their powers. Their actions cause an international conflict uh, because they find like some ancient uh, mysterious artifact from the sea floating in an iceberg off the Costa Rican coast. They find a man and a woman wearing some kind of pirate garb reaching out to touch each other, but not quite touching. And they're frozen in time. Okay. And this man and women, this man and woman seem to have the same tattoos on their hand on their hands that Peter and Saul have on their hands. And so there's some kind of connection here with uh, the, uh, the voodoo ceremony and what happened to Peter and Saul and this ancient couple uh, frozen in this iceberg that they've found. So for some reason, finding this iceberg touches off some kind of international conflict. It's not entirely clear. Honestly, it's a little confusing, but uh, so now void escapes with the source of their powers uh, to an endless void inside the void void meets exult which is spelled X apostrophe U-L-T. So like cult, but with an X and an apostrophe. So Void meets Xult, the powerful being who apparently is responsible for his and Null's powers. And they decide to work together to bring chaos to the world. Uh, Xult is later challenged by Superman and Batman. Null and Void team up with Xult in his efforts against our heroes. Um, However, Void is defeated by Batman and Null and uh, Superman uh, causes Exult to return to his own time after Superman is briefly exiled in this psychedelic void realm, which is where a lot of this incredible imagery from Trevor Von Eden comes from. Uh, Null and Void's powers disappear for good. Superman and Batman return to Gotham, and Saul decides to confess to all of his crimes with Peter, and off they go to certain imprisonment. Okay, so that's a bit of a summary of these four issues. That's probably better than I could have done extemporaneously, although I realize that still leaves a lot uh, to be answered answered story-wise. But honestly, I read all four issues. There's nothing super memorable about the story, but oh my goodness, check out this artwork. Like this artwork is just insane. Um, And I got to give it up a little bit to Carl Gafford also for some extraordinarily eye-popping colors and some incredibly bold color choices. But really the star of the show here in my mind is Trevor Von Eden with an assist to Pablo Marcos, who I think does a phenomenal job of inking Trevor on issue 305 here. But just look at this artwork, look at the choices being made by Trevor, uh, first in concert with Pablo and Carl, and later Trevor inking himself and still working with Carl. Um, This is just some of the most wild superhero art published ever by DC Comics, certainly some of the wildest of the 80s. You know, we talked about Trevor Von Eden's finishes on Thriller and the way he preserved a high degree of emotion and just the energy that we normally associate with pencils and the penciling of a comic and the way that one would see the pencils of a comic and just say, oh man, there's this incredible energy in the pencils that just gets lost by the time it gets translated into a polished inking job all too often. 
Trevor Von Eden was doing something so interesting with his finishes, and there were so few people in mainstream comics that frankly attempted or were allowed to have this level of impressionistic roughness in their pencil work, the only, or in their inking work rather, the only people that I can think of that had finishes that were this comparably rough and raw in the eighties are perhaps uh, Klaus Janssen. And, you know, I don't know how Klaus got away with some of the ways that he would finish things, but I think that Jansen's work had an amazing roughness and vitality to it, combined with an incredible knowledge and understructure of drawing, which I think that Trevor also possesses to a tremendous degree here. And that valuable, solid understructure, the actual drawing skill underneath all this rawness, I think is absolutely essential because otherwise you're going to be left with you know, just some indie outsider art that might be interesting, but less formally solid and I think less kind of worthy of analysis perhaps. But I think looking at Trevor's work here, uh, it also calls to mind a little bit uh, Zafino um, and Zafino's work on, um, you know, Winter World and the Punisher book that he did. And of course, uh, Jorge Zafino is uh, rightly celebrated and uh, seen as one of the uh, great comic artists of modern times. And uh, his son, of course, is also a phenomenal artist these days as well. But I think that Trevor is one of the few guys in that club of raw, rough finishes in comics in the 80s. And I was a little bit shocked to learn from this interview with Trevor that uh, that I referred to, that I'm now going to quote from with Michelle Fife, that Trevor himself was not actually thrilled with the way that he was finishing these comics. And I took it as like some incredibly bold, inventive, and brave work that he was doing, but Trevor apparently had different thoughts on it. So, so allow me to quote here a little bit what Trevor thought of the work he was doing, and then we'll come circle back to some of the influences and and uh, where this is all coming from. So, so Fife talks to Trevor first off about Thriller, and he says, uh, you know, did you see Thriller as an opportunity to use the form of comics as a vehicle for experimentation? Trevor's response is no. Thriller was an opportunity to use the form as a vehicle for original expression, never experimentation. I never experiment. I express what I know. The very term experiment seems incredibly arrogant, inconsiderate, and condescending to me. I can't stress this enough. Whether or not it will sell that to a corporate mind, which is usually full of cliches and stereotypes, is an experiment. I take great pains to both find out and express what I know, I intend to lead my life according to what I know and have discovered firsthand. I never believe what I've been told. I believe what I know. To a corporate mentality, it was an experiment on their part, not mine. Okay? And Trevor goes on to say, in my case, all the experimentation goes on inside my head. My visual art generally, almost always, comes from the desire to depict or illustrate a concept in my head. And the concept's always in the form of a sentence or two. In my comics career, I'd have to translate my writer's ideas into concepts that inspired my art. The only experimentation I indulge in is in creating the concept that I want to draw. As I'd said, I like to draw ideas. That's what comics are all about to me, telling stories. Okay, so Trevor is clearly an incredibly thoughtful and iconoclastic dude. And the more that you read interviews with Trevor or listen to interviews with Trevor, you get the sense that he thought very deeply and he thinks very deeply about comic book art in a way that is unique and honestly inspiring because you can tell that he is putting his whole heart and soul and body and mind into not just doing the work but thinking about the work and and i think it's actually just fascinating to me because oftentimes an artist whether you're a a creator who's a visual artist or whether you're a writer or any other kind of a popular artist in general or any kind of artist, you're not necessarily always the best judge of your own work. You're not necessarily the best final arbiter of what your high points in your career are. And I think a lot of artists are aware of that as well. And it's really interesting to me because I find this work that we're looking at here in World's Finest to be so high level, just full of energy, vitality, and clearly inspired work. And yet, 
to hear Trevor tell it, he was going through a deep depression during this time, and he was not at all happy with the roughness of the finishes of his work here or in the somewhat legendary fill-ins he did on Batman and the Outsiders during this time, which were also incredibly rough. And those books and these issues, I think, owe a lot to some of Trevor's primary influences, who would be Jack Kirby and Alex Toth. And I think those are Trevor's number one and two influences, according to uh, what he has said on the record. Uh, Trevor absolutely adores, and rightfully so, Jack Kirby, and he deeply admires the work of Alex Toth as well. And I think you can see both those influences loud and clear here in Trevor's work, along with the personality and the line work that is so unique that feels just like Von Eden to me. And um, to hear Trevor talk about that line work, though, here is quite interesting. Uh, so Trevor goes on to say um, here, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. Trevor critiqued the work himself and talked about how he wished that he had inked his work better after Thriller. And Fife pushes back on that, rightfully so. And uh, Michelle Fife says, I wouldn't say that your work was inked badly at all. It was energetic and instantly stood out. Although you say that you were depressed and aggravated with comics, the art on some of that post-thriller work seems highly inspired. Yes, 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 yes. Um, One million percent. I am so on board with what Michelle is saying here. And I have to really thank Michelle Fife for calling attention to Trevor Von Eden's work in modern times, because I think it was this interview that uh, that Fife did with Von Eden in issue number 298 of the Comics Journal in May of 2009 that really brought to my attention how singular and amazing Von Eden's work was from this period, because somehow I think I had just missed it or I hadn't quite got it early on. But when Fife spoke to Trevor and talk to him at length in this issue of the journal, which, by the way, uh, has the uh, Brazilian twins Gabriel Ba and Fab- Fabio Moon on the cover talking about Umbrella Academy, and they're kind of the uh, the cover feature for this issue of the journal. But it is a lengthy, uh, career-spanning interview with Von Eden that is conducted brilliantly by Fife, and he just got Trevor on the record talking about so much stuff here that was really candid and fascinating about Trevor's entire career that it really piqued my interest. And I think that's what motivated my own deep dive into Von Eden's work. And so here, when Fife sticks up for the work and talks about how it is highly inspired, and he's talking about these world's finest issues, and he actually mentions them by name, uh, he says, it's as if your frustrated state of being inadvertently led you to get looser and bolder while retaining structural control. And yep, that is exactly what I see when I look at this work here. It's that undergirding of the structural solidity that I was referring to earlier, where Von Eden is clearly extremely knowledgeable about how to draw anatomy and figure and facial expression and and the acting of his figures in the frame and more than anything just the storytelling choices of the panel construction the composition the angles i mean von eden is as much of a natural and as much of a gifted comic artist as i think you will find in mainstream comics and all of this is borne out by the fact that for those who don't realize trevor von eden was the youngest comic book artist ever hired by DC Comics at the age of 16. At the age of 16, they hired him and he co-created the character of Black Lightning with Tony Isabella. And as if that was not a significant enough achievement, Trevor Von Eden was not only the first or the youngest I should say he was the youngest artist they ever hired at 16. He was the first ever black artist hired by DC Comics. And so when you combine those two legendary status accomplishments together, it's quite extraordinary that the same person is the youngest artist hired by DC and their first black artist. And, uh, That is ultimately a blessing and a curse for Von Eden as he goes forward in his career because his own experience at DC Comics is ultimately bittersweet, to say the least. And I think we get into the details behind that in the Thriller episode where Chris and I talk at great length 
four hours plus, I believe, about uh, the issues that Trevor had with DC. And uh, if you're curious about that, I would recommend checking out that episode. But basically, all of this to say that Trevor Von Eden was such a singular presence at DC Comics, and the work he was doing was so unique. And so it's so great that FIFA has got him on the record talking about it at length here. And I, I really see a kindred spirit for myself here in Michel Fife's appreciation, his deep appreciation of Trevor's work, as well as a lot of the other artists that uh, Fife has taken the time and the care to profile and call more attention to on his website, uh, people like Mark Badger and uh, people who I think were just amazing innovators at that time, like Von Eden, who just didn't get the attention they deserved. So so yeah, major props to Fife for for calling this work out and having the, you know, the, the eye and and the uh, the passion for it to to keep telling people about this great work because that's the exact same reason that we Chris and I wanted to launch this show Comics Rot Your Brain is there has been so much just unbelievably high level comic book art from the eighties that was not Watchmen or Dark Knight or mouse. And there are so many books that have fallen between the cracks of history. And that's the exact reason we wanted to launch this show. So thank you for everyone who's here on the ride with us and enjoying the deep discussion of these really, truly legendary creators whose work deserves to be celebrated more. Okay. Having said that, sorry for the detour. Back to Fife talking to Von Eden. He says specifically, your last two world's finest issues and a few outsider stories immediately come to mind. Clearly, you were still responding to something beyond your professional task or your personal woes. Okay, so this is Fifi again talking about the work looking highly inspired during this period, like these world's finest issues that we're looking at today. And Trevor really feeling like this was a dark period for him and and not thinking that highly of the work himself. And so what Trevor goes on to say here, is remarkable. Trevor says, all of my art is an honest and direct expression of my state of mind at the very moment of creation. To me, that's mandatory in being an artist. But the looser aspect of my line work is actually what displeased me upon later viewing of the work. My pages are always laid out first in light pencil, at which stage I concern myself solely with panel to panel, page design, and the relationship of the elements within each panel to each other. All that is in service of the most dramatically effective and aesthetically pleasing way of telling the story. Once a page has been drawn in light pencil, I then finish the images with a darker number two pencil. After that, I ink it. The looser quality of the inked line work that you found so bold and expressive would have been more pleasing to me had I taken the time or felt the desire to refine it further. All right. Now that for me, I'm just stepping outside the interview here. For me, that's a hard disagree for me <laughs> with what Trevor's saying, because it's that exact same looseness, the rawness, the roughness, the gestural quality, the unfinished quote unquote energy in the line work that to me is in fact so breathtaking and such an exquisite use of the comic book medium to convey emotion, energy, vitality, and kineticism on the page in a way that all too few comic book artists have ever been capable of then or now. And I think the combining of that with that underlying structural solidity and knowledge that Fife spoke of, I think that's where you get this remarkable juxtaposition of raw energy and feeling alive along with someone who really deeply understands how to tell a story and how to draw things. Uh, and it's worth noting that one of Trevor's main mentors, perhaps I think maybe even the person he would describe as his principal mentor in um, real life was Neil Adams. And so uh, talk about having a structurally solid grounding in the fundamentals of drawing human anatomy and, you know, page design and just all of the nuts and bolts of deep, high level comic book thinking. Neil Adams and working at Continuity Studios with Neil was a big part of Trevor Von Eden's knowledge base and his learning in his own career. And I know Trevor had very, very positive things to say about Neil and his time working with Neil Adams. So Trevor Von Eden is drawing from the well of Jack Kirby, who is his all-time favorite comic artist, because of course he is, because Jack Kirby is the greatest American comic book artist of all time. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I guess my own pantheon is like 
Kirby obviously is the greatest comic artist of all time. And Trevor, for me, is my favorite comic book artist of modern times. My personal favorite in my lifetime of reading comics. Because by the time I started in 84, Jack was pretty much, uh, you know, in his twilight and on his way out. So Von Eden, just to be clear, is my favorite comic artist of my lifetime. And Kirby obviously is the greatest American comic book artist of all time. And Trevor would agree with that. And all right thinking people would agree with that. And if you are listening to this and you don't believe Jack Kirby is the greatest American comic book artist of all time, well, well then I'm sorry. Um, you're fucking up and we just can't be friends because there is no, there is no other correct answer to the question of who is the greatest American comic book artist of all time. It is not even close. It's not even close. There's really not even a conversation to be had there. Uh, it is not anyone other than Kirby, but that is a, a topic for another discussion. And um, Trevor has uh, has very profoundly sung Kirby's praises as well in a number of these interviews, which I found really charming because I love when artists give it up for other artists and artists are passionate about other comic art, you know? And uh, I just think it's a beautiful thing. Oh, and that reminds me of... Uh, Dave Mazzuchelli and how passionate David Mazzuchelli was at the time about Trevor's art. So there's a quote from Mazzuchelli that I want to read to you guys also in a moment. But um, okay, but before we get to that, Trevor now is talking about his work and how he thought if it was refined further, somehow it would have been better. Okay, let's he, let's hear him out. Let's hear him out and let's hear what he's saying. He goes on to say. It's much like writing feverishly in the grip of a flood of emotion when your pen seems almost incapable of putting down your thoughts with the rapidity with which they occur. The quality of your handwriting, if it's, it's legibility, it suffers, despite the content and meaning of the words written. The same writings, words neatly printed or typewritten, are much more effective in this more legible form. Again, I gotta disagree here, Trevor. I gotta disagree, <laughs> but okay. Um... When it comes to drawing, when it comes to art, I've got to disagree. When it comes to the legibility of handwriting, I get it. I understand. But this comic art was far from illegible. So that's just me editorializing again. Okay. Um, the ideas expressed are more easily communicated to the reader without the unnecessary distraction of having to interpret and or decipher words written in a fevered rush. Fellow artists might find this interesting. Being able to understand and relate to the creative force behind such bold and loose scribbling, much as a pharmacist is able to decipher a physician's seemingly incomprehensible hieroglyphics on a prescription. But to the layman or average reader, this is an unnecessarily distracting chore. I pride myself in my best work on refining my line work to the point at which it clearly expresses my intentions without the loss of any dramatic effect or power. Much of my post-thriller inks fueled by prolonged bouts of profound depression, lack this necessary refinement or professional polish from my point of view. It's like seeing the raw, rough first draft of a script that someone has written, replete with mistakes, redundancies, and rough passages, expressively revelatory to a fellow writer, as opposed to the final draft of the same material, refined, edited, and made ready for public consumption. The same work, just in a more easily accessible form to the reader. My general state of mind at the time, combined with a pronounced lack of interest in the mediocre scripts I'd been given to illustrate, precluded this final polishing of my inks during this long and dark period of my life. Instead of letting pages sit for a while and coming back to them later in a clearer state of mind, quality checking, as is my usual method, I'd literally finish him, then get rid of him by handing them in as soon as I was done. The joy of creation in my finished inked drawings, but not in my page design or storytelling, which remained consistent, the structural control you'd mentioned, it was noticeably absent from my mind in this period. It's that very joy in creating and expressing a part of one's own soul in the elements of one's art that propels an artist to polish, burnish, refine, and just plain caress his creation to its absolute peak of expressive perfection before final presentation. Just look at Michelangelo's sculpture and then remember how they had all started out as crude, ragged, and unrefined blocks of rough-hewn marble stone. 
To me, this is what being a, quote, professional artist is all about. Not just expressing your soul honestly, but also expressing it to an audience, keeping their wants and needs in mind as well. But please don't forget, in my mind, my audience at that time were not the fans, but rather the editors for whom I'd worked. And frankly, Michelle, I didn't give a damn about them under the circumstances in which I'd found myself. All that said and done, I am happy to hear that some kind of positive energy did manage to rise up out of the murk and impress itself in some form on the sensibilities of some of the comics reading public. Despite my depressed and angry state of mind, I don't share that view. Of course, I wish in hindsight that I'd taken the time to execute my visuals with more dispassionate deliberation and less passionate emotion. But in my troubled state of mind back then, that was just simply not possible. My art, specifically the quality of my inked line work at the time, was cathartic rather than communicative in both its nature and intent. Frankly, that's what I really regret. A professional should always put the needs of his clients in my field, the readers, first. To this day, that's what I truly regret not having done during those dark and depressing days of my early career. Okay. Well, let me just say respectfully that I could not disagree more. And I believe that this work that Von Eden was putting down during this period really ended up becoming a sort of a map and an inspiration to many of his contemporaries and his peers during this time whether it was David Mazzuchelli, who was on the record talking about what a huge fan he was of Trevor's work during this period and how inspiring it was, or whether it was Frank Miller, who also, we know for a fact, had reached out to Trevor to be the artist on Batman Year One originally. He was Miller's first choice. Or whether we're talking about Michel Fife, the extraordinary cartoonist and artist in his own right, and the creator of his own Copra, the amazing indie comic still going today, who was deeply and profoundly inspired by Von Eden also during this period. So it breaks my heart, honestly, to hear the kind of regret that Trevor has for producing work that to me, frankly, has so much heart and so much magic in it. And I understand that it came out of a period of depression and darkness and sadness for him, but all I see is emotion and skill and an ability to communicate a lot better than I think he even realized because it all comes across to me as deeply emotional work that on some level, he cared about. And if he didn't care about it, my God, uh, wow, he was doing an amazing job of just purely on autopilot, putting down some of the most truly engaging and fascinating mark making and storytelling that was published full stop at DC Comics during this unbelievably vital period of the 1980s. And um, I'm just looking at these issues, and I, I hope a lot of you folks will agree with me when you see the artwork going by here. But if you liked Jorge Zafino, if you, if you liked David Mazzuchelli, if you liked Sergio Toppi, if you liked so many artists that fill their work with raw emotion and energy, then I have to believe that you're going you're gonna to love seeing Trevor Von Eden and what he was doing on these pages. If you liked Klaus Janssen, if you like the idea of communicating honest, raw emotion through ink on paper, uh, this work from Von Eden is just endlessly inspiring in terms of the humanity, the poignancy, and the emotion that you can feel in this work. And knowing that the artist was going through such a rough time in his life actually, I think, is even more inspiring. And it shows you what a true artist Trevor Von Eden was and is. Because whether he realized it or not, he was putting that emotion in the work. And whether he regrets it or not, I am just so endlessly grateful that Trevor Von Eden had the ability, the opportunity, and the desire 
to become a comic book artist and to push to push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable as a comic book artist because i think he really did inspire so many people myself included to just really push the boundaries in whatever art form you're in and to know that your work is not just for that time period but that your work is for everyone in the future for all of time and if you really put something genuine and true in the work well then it's going to last it's going to last and some knuckleheads on a podcast 40 years later are going to be singing your praises whether you know it or not and having said that um let me just uh try to wrap things up a little bit here by talking about uh what uh, David Mazzuchelli said about Trevor's work. And I've got that Mazzuchelli quote here. So let me uh, let me share this with you folks. So this is Mazzuchelli speaking specifically about these comics that we're looking at here today, these world's finest issues. Okay, so David Mazzuchelli said this. Back when I was starting out as a comics pro, I wasn't familiar with Trevor Von Eden's work, but his issues of world's finest comics or maybe Thriller, but I think World's Finest came first. Uh, he's he's wrong there, just for the record. Thriller came first, followed immediately by these World's Finest issues. But anyways, Mazzuchelli goes on to say, The work really caught my eye. I was frankly astonished that these were mainstream books. The drawing was rock solid, but loose, almost scribbly, bold and powerful. Compositions were daring, challenging, sometimes bordering on incomprehensible. I felt like I was watching an artist in the process of bursting from a chrysalis. What would he do next? I'd like to think that something of what excited me on those pages found its way into Batman Year One, but my own work from back then seems mighty tame next to Mr. Von Eden's. Okay, so uh, that's a pretty amazing quote from one of the absolute goat greatest comic artists of modern times. Of course, David Mazzuchelli uh, and his body of work, although relatively small, speaks for itself with the number of stone cold classics under his belt. We don't need to go on today about Daredevil, Born Again, or Batman Year One, or Asterios Polyp, or uh, Rubber Blanket. We don't need to talk about how brilliant David Mazzuchelli is, but to hear the respect and the wonder and the awe and amazement that Mazzuchelli had for Von Eden's work, I think really, really says it all. And... You know, um, other artists know and other artists notice, um, you know, and all this is just, I just fascinating to consider, um, just the shock waves that were going out from this work from Von Eden. So having said all of that, um, I think, why don't we close with Trevor's thoughts on Jack Kirby and Alex Toth, uh, his own biggest inspirations, because I personally find it really heartwarming and amazing when artists can speak at length about the artists that inspire them. And let me just say that it's really impressive at how good so many artists can be at talking about their sources of inspiration and hearing Mazzuchelli talk about Trevor's work bursting forth from a chrysalis and hearing Trevor talk about Kirby or Toth or all these guys. I, I think it's just super cool when you've got these incredibly thoughtful artists really being contemplative and putting into words something that is quite difficult, just the sort of ephemeral and sometimes uh, just unique visual inspiration and jolt they get from their favorite artists. And yeah, I just, I find this kind of stuff to be just endlessly fascinating. So, um, so Trevor talking about Jack Kirby says this, he says, the house of ideas died with Jack Kirby. Now there was a fountain of creativity. About the king, I need say no more, except that he was the king, period. No greater creative force of pure and unparalleled imagination and energy has ever been unleashed upon the comics page. The man, the artist, was brilliant, profound, dynamic, philosophical, exciting, overwhelming, incomparably original, and above all, intensely 
and unforgettably human. Well, I can just say to Trevor that I believe that he's done his principal inspiration, Jack Kirby, proud because every single thing that Trevor just said about Kirby's work is something that I believe we can also say about Trevor Vaughn Eden's art. Brilliant, profound, dynamic, philosophical, exciting, overwhelming, incomparably original, and above all, intensely and unforgettably human. And I cannot think of a more evocative and appropriate description of what I love so much about the work of Trevor Von Eden, as well as the extraordinary Jack Kirby. So maybe we should end it there, but you know what? Let's just also hear what Trevor has to say about Alex Toth. Alex Toth, whose work I discovered at Continuity, was my second influence after Kirby. Toth's work was abstract, graphic simplicity at its best, the exact opposite of Neil Adams' surgical knowledge. Toth's art was the important elements of any scene or situation stripped to the bone, with absolute technical knowledge as its base. Neil piled layer upon layer of beautiful drawings into creations of technically beautiful, technically perfect beauty, seemingly correct in every detail. It was pure thought made visible. Toth's art, like Kirby's, seemed to come straight from the artist's subconscious. It was imagination made visible. And I believe that although Trevor was mentored by Neil Adams and I believe did have the benefit of that underlying structural foundation and surgical knowledge that Neil Adams, I think, tried to instill in all the artists he worked with and mentored a continuity, I think the Von Eden certainly benefited from that. I think ultimately Von Eden clearly came down on the Jack Kirby and Alex Toth side of the ledger when it came to storytelling in comics. Because once again, hearing Trevor talk about what he loved about Toth's work, man, does it sound like what I love about Trevor's work. Toth's art, like Kirby's, seemed to come straight from the artist's subconscious. It was imagination made visible. Look at these pages in World's Finest, folks. Tell me that this is not imagination made visible. Tell me that these psychedelic pages of Superman are not just breathtaking. Tell me that Superman floating in the void with the, you know, fractured panels all around him and the freaked out look on his face is not one of the most unique Superman representations you've ever seen. I mean, at the end of the day, why are people making comics? Why are people reading comics? I think it is to see these unbelievable singular imaginations bursting forth, ideally unfiltered, but of course, because we live in a world where commerce and art are constantly at odds with each other, and Trevor Von Eden as the youngest black artist, no, no, I'm sorry, the youngest artist at DC Comics, and also the first black artist at DC Comics, you have to know that Trevor Von Eden was in the crosshairs of a lot of folks at DC Comics who probably resented him for multiple reasons. And the fact that he was such a unique figure, I mean, 16 years old, he's drawing professional comics. This is unbelievable. The fact that he was such a unique figure there in the 80s, and on top of that, decided to push the boundaries of what was acceptable to the nth degree. That is just breathtaking, and perhaps it's unsurprising that he ran up against some resistance at DC Comics and had to unfortunately contend with racism and jealousy and petty vindictiveness and also probably a lot of just closed-minded, corporate, just, you know, non-thinking, commerce-driven bullshit and a lot of people who frankly were not passionate or knowledgeable, but they just happened to be in positions of authority. You know, we all know what that's like in our day-to-day -day life and our day-to-day -day jobs. But Von Eden somehow in the midst of all of that still managed to leave us in the 80s with these incredible gifts, these incredible gifts that he scattered across his career at DC Comics, whether it was a fill-in issue of Vigilante written by Mar Marv Wolfman, 
issue number 14 for the record, which is an amazingly drawn comic on its own. And maybe we'll feature that one day on our show. But that's just an incredible single issue story of Vigilante where Trevor is the uh, penciler and inker. Whether it's that story or whether it's the Batman and the Outsiders issues, the aforementioned fill-ins he did on that book, which are just unbelievably drawn, just so powerful, or whether it was some uh, some fill-in work he did on Batman or Detective Comics or, you know, a, a short story here, a short story there. Trevor scattered these gifts like jewels across the, uh, the, what do you call it, the ocean of comics published by DC Comics over these last decades. And I will say it is absolutely worth it for you to dig up every one of these Trevor Von Eden jewels that he blessed us with, because every one of them is worth studying and savoring. Because the man's a once in a lifetime talent and getting that kind of work put out by a major corporation is not something you see every day. It looks more alive, more vital, more raw, more personal, more unique than almost any comic that we see published out there. So uh, once again, here on CRYB, we, we, uh, we happily call your attention to Trevor Von Eden and uh, this amazing job of art he turned in on World's Finest Comics numbers 305 and 307 and uh you know it's just it doesn't get doesn't get much better than this folks all right well thank you all for listening to me ramble on for nearly an hour about the glories of trevor von eden if you want to know more about trevor trevor's story and all about this fascinating figure who uh by the way he, he hails originally from guyana he moved to america at the age of 10 can you imagine moving to America at the age of 10 and then five, six years later, you're getting hired as the youngest artist at DC Comics? What a life story. What an amazing, just an amazing life and an amazing figure. So if you want to know more about Trevor, go listen to our uh, episode on Thriller, as I've said here a few times. But otherwise, thank you for tuning in to CRYB Comics Rot Your Brain. And uh, we'll be back again with another episode with me and Chris uh, talking about uh, more of these obscure 80s comics that you all love. And if you're still listening right now, please remember to hit the uh, hit the bell icon on YouTube there so you can be notified when we drop new episodes. And also, please, uh, if you're so inclined, give us a like, give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this, uh, this 80s comics talk today. And also feel free to chime in with a comment. Love to hear from everybody. And we try to respond to all of you in the comment section. Okay. And uh, please feel free to suggest other comics or other artists that you feel deserve the old CRYB examination under, under our proverbial magnifying glass. Okay. Uh, that's all for this week, folks. Um, we still haven't thought of a good tagline for the show. But uh, let's say um, maybe for all you creators out there thinking of making comics, I know it's not easy. It's never easy for anyone trying to pursue a, a creative path in life. I will tell you for sure, I can relate. Life gets in the way. Life will do all manner of things to get in your way. But please take solace and take inspiration from the fact that during one of the darkest periods in his life, when he was not necessarily feeling inspired, Trevor Von Eden still managed to put his nose to the grindstone and produce some of the most inspired comic art I've ever seen. So when you're looking at what's in front of you, all of you folks considering creative projects of your own, and I'm speaking very much to myself here, and I believe this is a message that Trevor would endorse for all you comics creators out there, stop making excuses and start making comics. Thank you all. See you next time.